experiencia única con la... Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to Spotify's Key 3 2020 Earnings Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. If you require further assistance, please press star zero. I would now like to hand the call over to your speaker today, Brian Goldberg, Head of Investor Relations. Thank you. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you, and welcome to Spotify's third quarter 2020 earnings conference call. I hope everyone's continuing to stay safe. Our team is again hosting this call remotely. Our CEO, Daniel Eck, is participating from Stockholm. Paul Vogel, our CFO, is at his home office in New Jersey, and I'm joining from New York. We'll start with opening comments from Daniel. After the remarks, Daniel and Paul will be happy to answer your questions. We'll again be taking questions exclusively through Slido. Questions can be submitted by going to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and using the code hashtag Spotify Earnings Q320. Analysts can ask questions directly into Slido, and all participants can then vote on the questions they find the most relevant. If for some reason you don't have access to Slido, you can email Investor Relations at ir at spotify.com, and we'll add in your question. Before we begin, let me quickly cover the safe harbor. During this call, we'll be making certain forward-looking statements, including projections or estimates about the future performance of the company. These statements are based on current expectations and assumptions that are subject to risks and uncertainties. Actual results could materially differ because of factors discussed on today's call in our letter to shareholders and in filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. During this call, we'll also refer to certain non-IFRS financial measures. Reconciliations between our IFRS and non-IFRS financial measures can be found in our letter to shareholders in the financial section of our investor relations website and also furnished today on Form 6K. And with that, I'll turn the call over to Daniel. All right. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us. So Q3 was a very strong quarter, surpassing our own expectations on several measures. I think this is a testament to all the amazing contributions of the Spotify team who in these uncertain times remain focused on the needs of our creators, fans, and partners around the world. Monthly active users beat the top end of our guidance, and subscribers hit the very top end of our range. And our service now reaches 320 million users and 144 million subscribers. The size of our total catalog increased significantly, and our advertising business returned to growth. And we also beat expectations in our newest markets, where we're seeing growth continue to accelerate. I think this affirms our belief that there's a significant pent-up demand for Spotify around the world, even in places where our service has yet to launch. These results illustrate the power of our business despite COVID and other related challenges across the globe. And as a result of our performance this quarter, we have updated our Q4 guidance ranges to reflect increased optimism on where we expect to end the year. It's also worth noting that we've paid out more than a billion to rights holders in every quarter in 2020. And I'm proud to say that we're on track to pay another billion plus in Q4. In addition to sharing our results, I believe these calls are also time to help frame where we're headed. And our team remains laser focused on building the world's largest audio network. And while it's still early days, it's clear to us that our strategy is working. So we know that when we reach more listeners, we're able to attract more creators to our platform. So with more reach comes more content. And with more content, especially content unique to Spotify, there comes more opportunities to monetize. And that interplay is super important because it's really the foundation of our flywheel. And that flywheel continues to accelerate faster with every new user and creator that comes on our platform. Bottom line, as I look at the increase specifically in reach that we're seeing this quarter, it gives me the confidence in our ability to monetize that growth. So to fuel the flywheel, you'll see us continue to invest in enhancing our user experiencing, uh, furthering market expansion, and develop and acquiring unique content for both new and established creators. And related to this, you've seen us make a few big moves in launching new content, so I would like to shed some light on how it's going. Our number of new podcasts increased over 20%, and music releases are up 13% over the prior quarter. And we saw a strong positive reaction when Michelle Obama and Joe Rogan's podcast launched during the quarter, and we're seeing great success with our original exclusives, which now account for more than 19% of all podcast listening on the platform. In addition, we're hard at work on new content development that will roll out in the months ahead. 
And one of the residual benefits of our time indoors is that many creators have turned, at, turned back to what they do best, which is creating. And as a result, future mu music releases look very strong too. And as we know, new music is now coming from artists like Billie Eilish, Drake, and Sir Paul McCartney, just to name a few. Another benefit of the investments that we made in our content and user experience is that Spotify listeners are enjoying greater value than ever before. And we believe this presents two distinct opportunities. So one, with about 60% of Spotify subscribers starting out in our free tier and our off performance on MAUs in 2020, we are confident that we have a long runway to continue to grow our subscriber base in the months and years ahead. And two, long term, if engagement and or our listener value per hour is high, it gives us the ability to selectively increase our price. So here's how I think about it. While our primary focus remains user growth, based on our maturity in certain markets and the increasing value we provide to our subscribers, including, of course, enhanced content, we've seen engagement and more specifically value per hour grow substantially over these past few years. And I believe an increase in value per hour is the most reliable signal we have in determining when we're able to use price as a lever to grow our business. And while it's still early, initial results indicate that in the markets where we've tested increasing prices, our users believe that Spotify remains an exceptional value and they have shown a willingness to pay more for our service. So as a result, you'll see us further expand price increases, especially in places where we're well positioned against the competition and our value per hour is high. I would, however, throw in one big caveat. We will continue to tread carefully in these COVID times to ensure we don't get ahead of the market. So to wrap it up, it was a really strong quarter. And as history has shown us, while we don't always nail the timing, we're usually right in predicting the outcome of our strategy. I continue to believe in the long-term value of each and every listener on Spotify, and there are still billions of listeners that we've yet to reach around the world. Listeners who try Spotify tend to stay, and they often convert to a subscriber. That is why our continued focus is on reaching more listeners, as ultimately this will translate into long-term value for our investors. And with that, I'll turn it back to Brian. Thanks, Daniel. Again, if you have any questions, please go to slido.com, hashtag Spotify earnings Q320. Once your question is entered, you can edit or withdraw your question by selecting the option in the bottom right. We'll be reading the questions in the order they come in with respect to how people vote up their preference for questions. And our first question today comes from Matthew Thornton. When you think about the two-sided marketplace longer term, do you believe that there is opportunity to monetize and play a role in accelerating the discovery, consumption, growth of live and virtual events, as well as memorabilia and merchandise? Um, yes. So, so long term, if you think about our marketplace strategy, it's essentially about having creators meet fans. And so um, there's three distinct components of this. One is to grow their fan bases. Uh, the second is to engage uh, further in their fan bases, and the third is monetizing those fan bases. And we're going to uh, create tools and services in all three of these categories. First, how you um, grow your fan base. Um, second, in how you engage with your fan base. And then thirdly, in how you monetize it. And of that, of course, live um, is a very, very interesting component, as is merchandise as well. And we're early days in some of our experiments, but I, I do think uh, the future of the platform certainly holds a lot more uh, of those types of tools um, as well. All right. Our next question comes from Michael Morris from Guggenheim. How has Jay, excuse me, uh, uh, Joe Rogan performed overall since launching on Spotify? Any indication that listeners from other platforms are migrating to Spotify in advance of exclusivity? Yeah, so the um, so Jerry has performed really well um, so far. It's exceeded expectations uh, since it's uh, been mo moved over to our platform. Um, we obviously had some uh, expectations of how what would happen now and then what would happen in, in the exclusivity period. So we feel really good about how it's performed. It's, we've definitely had um, faster growth than we expected, uh, and we're expecting another step up when uh, when the uh, when the podcast goes exclusive to us uh, before the end of the year. 
All right, our next question comes from Richard Kramer of Arrest. Can you share some rough percentages of premium subscribers that are actually paying? We understand the number is around 60% with the remaining 40% under family plan. Yeah, so we don't break out the mix uh, by product. Um, as we've talked about, you know, ARPU, you know, has, you know, come down um, and some of that has been product mix or most has been product mix. And so family plan has grown as a percentage of the overall user base um, and it is a, um, a decent amount of our, our users right now. You know, for us, as we've talked about a lot, you know, we really look, we're looking holistically, as Daniel mentioned, about growing overall users and growing overall subscribers. And, and are we able to grow them in a way that is, uh, has a positive LTV to SAC, um, as something that's gonna be long-term profitable for both us as well as the industry to continue to add more users overall, to generate uh, more revenue, um, gross revenue uh, for the entire industry and for Spotify. And so you know, that's been a, a real big success for us. Um, and so with an LTV to stack of, of two and a half to three times, which has been pretty steady uh, since we've gone public, um, you know, we feel really good about the product mix within, uh, within our portfolio. All right, another question from Richard. Spotify has now had 15 straight quarters of declining premium ARPU, even adjusting for FX. With the industry trend towards further bundling, and towards saturation in developed markets, should investors expect any reversal of this trend in 2021? Yeah, so just sort of, I guess, dovetailing on my last answer, it, you know, for us, it, it has been historically about uh, really um, thinking about growing users and subscribers first uh, before worrying about the, the monetization part second. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, it really has been a focus on the holistically as the LTV to SAC, you know, positive and, and staying in that two and a half to, to three range. Um, you know, that being said, um, well, let me back up. And with, you know, ARPU in the quarter, um, you know, it was down, you know, 10%. It was down 6% on an FX neutral basis, which was pretty much in line with our expectation. So, you know, the quarter did, you know, stay in line with where we thought it would be. Um, we did announce uh, a, a little while ago, a couple weeks ago, um, that we have raised prices uh, in a few markets, continuing to test where it makes sense for us to potentially, you know, raise pricing, you know. And for us, it's that balance. It's continuing to that balance of growing users and subscribers. Um, and in markets where we think we have the opportunity to potentially raise prices, uh, we will, um, and we'll continue to test. You know, if you look back over the last five to 10 years, we've added a tremendous amount of value into this ecosystem. You know, now having sort of 65 to 70 million music tracks, 2 million podcasts, and we've done that without, you know, raising prices. So the value you're getting as a subscriber has, has definitely um, increased materially um, over that five to 10 years. And so for us, it's really looking at different markets in different regions looking at the overall streaming penetration in those markets, looking at our penetration in, in, in those markets, looking at the maturity of markets, you know, and thinking about where um, it may make sense, uh, you know, for price increases and, and, and where it may not. Uh, I would just reiterate what Daniel said in his opening comments, you know, we'll be very, um, you know, cautious and careful around COVID in terms of how we think about, you know, any potential price increases moving forward, you know, and again, we're still testing and learning and, and anything we do will, you know, will be very market specific. All right, our next question comes from Eric Sheridan at UBS. How should we think about podcast investments beyond 2020? Are you at the necessary scale or are further investments needed in areas such as tools for creation and measurement, exclusive content, and local language content outside the U.S.? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I actually just want to back up, and I think this kind of relates to the prior question uh, as well about this sort of long-term opportunity. Um, so one is we're aiming to be the number one audio platform in the world, and that category in itself is huge. We're talking about billions of uh, users and many, many millions of creators. And so to the extent that we're still cash flow positive and to the extent that the LTV to SAC is as favorable as we've seen in the past, we will continue to invest. And we still believe we're early days um, in our growth. And so that's why the vast majority of our focus has been on growing that user base um, and growing the number of subscribers rather than sort of raising prices. We are, however, uh, adding that to the mix because again, the overall growth in each and every market is the priority that we're having, and that's the revenue growth. And we can grow that by either adding more users or raising the prices of the existing users um, that we're doing it in. And so, uh, but because we, we really have this macro opportunity and we're still in the beginning, even though we have 320 million monthly active users, 
um, we still think that there are billions more um, to go after in, in this ecosystem, and we're going to invest in better tools. Um, and that will increase the engagement, and if it increases the engagement, that increases our ability to monetize them as well. And if you add them into marketplace and all these other things, you'll see monetization increase even further, and that could drive up ARPU and gross profit for both us and the whole ecosystem as well. All right, next question comes from Matthew Thornton. On pricing, you guys raised family plan price in seven markets. What are you seeing in those markets, for example, penetration, engagement, FX, something else that led you to raise price? Do you expect similar actions in more markets in fourth quarter and into 2021? Yes, yeah, so I guess I'll just reiterate what, what I said um, in, in the last question, which is, you know, for us, it's, it's about looking at each market individually, uh, looking at overall streaming, streaming growth, streaming penetration, you know, our market share there, you know, our position in those markets, um, and being smart and, and selective about where we, we think it made sense. So that's that's where it was for those seven markets. Um, they're also sort of geographically um, different, so ways to kind of test and learn and see um, how the impact of those price increases evolve. Um, again, we've done it selectively. We did it in Norway a little while ago. We did it in New Zealand um, a little while ago. Um, so we have some early learnings of, of what happens there. Um, no indications yet in terms of uh, – uh, any impact on uh, retention or turn or engagement or, or new subjects, too early to tell. But again, given how we've been smart about doing it selectively in the past, uh, we feel pretty confident about the, the markets we've, uh, we've changed so far. I, I would just um, add as an addition, Norway we did quite a while ago, and we do know that it had no impact whatsoever um, on our uh, negative impact, I should say. So um, that gives us confidence. We don't have a lot of data on these recent uh, market launches um, that we have that, that's um, mature yet, but it, it's looking very good. So I think this kind of adds to our, our uh, optimism and the framework that I outlined in the opening remarks about the value per hour, which is the thing that we're, we're looking at as we look at to our, to our future ability to raise prices. All right, next question uh, from Richard Kramer. Does Spotify get any revenue from hosting podcasts where ads are sold by the content owner creator? So the, the short answer is, is no. Obviously, we sell the ads for things that we own uh, or exclusively license. Um, we don't take uh, any revenue for things that just sort of gets passed through onto our platform. You know, that being said, you know, Daniel mentioned in his opening comments that, you know, on a trailing 30-day basis, 19%. Uh, of our podcast, MEU now engages with their own uh, O&O content. And so to the extent that that continues to move up on our platform, it gives us even more opportunity to, uh, you know, to monetize. All right, our next question comes from Justin Patterson. How do you think about TikTok's influence on the music industry? What, if any, traits from TikTok can you layer into your business? Yeah, um, TikTok is a great um, discovery vehicle uh, for music, um, as it is for a lot of cultural memes that's going on um, in the world today. Um, I, I, I obviously, like many others, are fascinated with the growth of it and fascinated with um, the creative expression from creators uh, on that platform and, and really the whole kind of remixing culture, I would say. Um, now, that said, um, related to Spotify, um, again, our focus isn't so much on making the average user a creator uh, that many of the social platforms do. We instead want to add superpowers to the people who want to be professional creators, and that's kind of our focus. But to the extent that we're looking at something like TikTok, it is more about um, giving our artists, um, looking at what they're doing uh, on that platform and making sure we provide more creative ways that allows them to express themselves on our platform too. And we have been trying out a number of these things, music and talk uh, being uh, the most obvious example that we launched more recently. Um, but there has also been uh, music stories um, as a way for creators to, to uh, talk about um, their um, content and their expression. Katy Perry's um, and Katy Perry made a, a great one more recently that I'd really encourage you guys to check out. All right, our next question comes from Rich Greenfield. Can you talk about the controversy created by the Joe Rogan podcast, and how are you handling this with your employees? 
Yeah. Um, uh, I, again, um, you know, o- overall, I, I would just say we have millions of millions of creators on the platform and almost 70 million pieces of content. Um, and the most important thing for us is that we, uh, anything we do on our platform is, is consistently applying those um, policies. So we have a content policy. Um, it's openly available. Anyone can look at it. Uh, we obviously review all the content go- that goes up, and it doesn't matter if you're Joe Rogan or anyone else. Uh, we do apply those policies. But uh, it's important to note that uh, it, th- this needs to be evenly applied, um, no matter um, if it's internal pressure or external pressure as well, because otherwise we are a creative platform for lots of, of creators and it's important that they know what to expect from our platforms. If we can't do that, um, then there are other choices for a lot of creators to go to. So that consistency is super important in terms of our messaging. All right, our next question comes from Eric Sheridan. <clears throat> Can you provide more granularity on the recovery and advertising trends? Is it a broader array of advertisers engaged with the platform? Is it a recovery in overall ad budget trajectory versus earlier this year? Can you quantify the exit rate in September that you referenced in the shareholder letter? Yeah, so the recovery was, was pretty broad-based. Um, if you look at it by, uh, you know, the different products we sell, you know, our direct business um, was pretty strong and sort of in line with our expectations and it improved. Um, you know, pretty significantly from a, um, a pretty significant downturn in, uh, in the prior quarter due to COVID. Um, we've seen programmatic, uh, you know, grow and was in line with expectations. And we saw particular strength on the Ad Studio side, which is our self-service tool. Um, you know, and podcasting was up pretty significantly year on year as well. So um, it was kind of, you know, that's sort of the, the breakdown of how advertising, you know, recovered. And, um, you know, we do feel good about where the quarter was and it you know, did, um, you know, perform a little bit above expectations. Uh, we think about the trajectory coming out of September, again, uh, pretty strong. We feel good about where it was. We were, you know, had positive, you know, advertising growth in all three months of Q3, um, and it built up, built upon itself within, within the quarter. Um, and I would say, while we don't explicitly guide um, to both premium or advertising revenue, you know, our expectation is that, um, you know, Q4 advertising revenue will, will grow faster than it did in Q3. All right, another question from Richard Kramer. How long do you anticipate until the two-sided marketplace effort covers covers its costs? Do you want to start with that one, Paul? Yeah, I'm not sure how to answer that since we, we don't actually <laughs> break up the, uh, the profitability or, or the cost of any of our businesses that way. I would say, um, you know, at a high level, we feel you know, really good about the two-sided marketplace in general. Um, we feel good about the trend through, uh, through the first nine months of the year. Um, and beyond that, I'm not really sure how to comment on that. I'll, I'll maybe turn it over to Daniel and talk about the marketplace growth in general. I, I think the metric that we evaluate our investments over is in whether or not the traction they have in the marketplace. And to that extent, on the marketplace side, what I, I'm encouraged by is that um, we're obviously seeing a tremendous uptick in our sponsored recommendations. So it's up 76%. And, um, you know, more importantly, uh, it's retained over 74% of the customers that uh, that experimented with the format the, from the quarter before. So that's a strong engagement metric, and it shows that we're providing a lot of value to the ecosystem. And that combined with the growth of the number of creators that are using that gives us the confidence that this will be a great thing for the music industry and a great thing for Spotify in the long term. All right, next question from Brian Russo of Credit Suisse. Can you help us quantify how much of your advertising revenue is related to podcast listening versus music and how different the growth rate of podcast-related advertising is from your overall advertising revenue growth? Yeah, we don't we don't break it out that way. I would say podcast revenue revenue was a significant uh, driver of growth in the quarter. Um, you know, it was up. Uh, you know, I would say very significantly from uh, from last year. So year over year growth in podcasting was very very strong. I think we feel really good about podcasting in general. Um, I think Q3, if my memory serves me correct, had about two x the number of podcast advertisers in Q3 than we did in Q2. And the retention among those advertisers was very high um, between the people who advertised in Q2, who advertised in Q3. 
Uh, we've seen, um, you know, big upfront podcast uh, media buys as well. So in general, the traction on podcasting is strong, both from a, a revenue standpoint, from a retention standpoint, and then a, from a growth in the number of podcast advertisers standpoint. All right, next question from Eric Sheridan. <clears throat> you cited a stronger than expected rush to launch and a successful India marketing campaign. How is your approach to market launches and or stimulating user acquisition in emerging markets evolved over the past few years and what that might mean for medium long-term growth prospects? Yeah, um, I mean, overall, it's a, it's an evolving toolbox is what I would say. Um, so I'll, I'll just give you one example. Uh, in the Western world, we tend to focus a lot on signups by email. In many of these emerging markets, you can't do that. It's all about um, phone numbers and the ability to interact with uh, already existing services like WhatsApp and others uh, to drive growth. So whether we're, we're, we're extending the toolbox and it adds a value and amortizes over the whole base, like, for instance, our WhatsApp integrations or Instagram integrations, um, or, for instance, the adding the sign-up uh, flow uh, to, to involve um, signing up via your phone number instead of uh, an email, all of those are sort of small changes and tweaks that we're adding that, that um, then gives benefits across the base globally. And so, so we continue to do that. And then the separate thing that we're doing is that because of our platform and our knowledge of culture and the team that we hire on the ground, we really focus on getting the cultural aspect right. So we invest a lot in understanding that um, and spending that time. And you see that very, very clearly when it goes right, such as the Russia launch, where you saw um, us not only like many international players get the international content right, but you saw people also to a wide degree um, getting the local content uh, right too. So it, it's the combination of those things, sort of macro learnings, but more importantly, I would say, say adding more tools in the toolbox, uh, which is something that we've been doing over these past years, but then compound, making us better and better and better as we launch new markets. And so I'm, I'm very encouraged by that. And But the big surprise that I do want to sort of um, address for all investors is that um, there seems to be a lot of pent-up demand for Spotify in markets that we haven't launched in. Um, and I think Russia is the great uh, existence proof of that. Um, and that has surprised uh, even us in internally. Uh, we, we were very optimistic about the launch, but it exceeded our wildest uh, expectations. So that's super encouraging, and that gives us um, even more reinforcement as we um, go and, and launch uh, the rest of the world. All right. <clears throat> Our next question comes from Josh Lay of Covenant Capital. Your churn rate has been declining due in part to low ARPU. How do you think of the balance between ARPU and churn? At what churn rate would you raise price? Yeah, so I think it's, it's obviously all tied together, right? We have um, a number of products um, that are um, uh, have very high retention that have helped to lower churn over time. Our affinity plans, like family plans and student plans, uh, have really done a, a good job from that standpoint. As we've, as we've talked about, not to sort of repeat myself again, but all of what you're talking about gets into that LTV to SAC calculation, and it's all about thinking about, you know, how are we growing overall revenue for the long term? How does that impact the overall churn and retention over the long term? And what's the maximum amount of sort of gross profit dollars we're going to get on a user over that period of time? Um, and that's sort of what we're thinking about. And so your churn has come down uh, for a couple of reasons, or well, I guess a number of reasons. But obviously, the product continues to get better. Um, so that's number one. Number two is just as you get bigger, the number of users you've had for a longer period of time, um, you have more users who are on your platform for a longer period of time, which naturally helps churn. Uh, when you have a product like ours, which is great. And so for us, it is, it is combining that, that balance. Uh, and as we talked about you know, before, um, you're looking at the, the ability to continue to grow users and continue to grow subscribers you know, over the long term and, and to get to the, the billion plus users that we, our long term target um, uh, is looking after and, and balancing that with what's the right um, you know, pricing for that. I would just also add is I, th I think the important mental model to look at this is a ladder. 
So we start off um, where uh, users in many cases are in either an illegal environment or in a much lower monetized environment like traditional radio in the U.S. for, for creators. And we then move them into our free tier. Uh, most of them don't wake up thinking, I'm going to pay $10 a month for music. Um, there are very few of those customers around that have that mindset. So we start getting them into the service. They like the service. They enjoy the service. Then whether it's a family plan or an introductory offer or just the fact that they love the service that gets them to upgrade to one of our plans, that's all good and great. But then what happens as they, they get to that plan and they get even more benefits, the ad-free environment, even more platforms where Spotify becomes available like Cars and Sonos and a bunch of other things, um, that adds to the experience and you're spending more and more and more hours on Spotify. And that's the value per hour metric that I was um, referencing in my introductory remarks. And the more hours you're spending, then the more value you're deriving from Spotify. And we're seeing a clear correlation with that and our ability to then later on raise prices. But the key here is to, to really kind of look at the balancing act for overall growth. That is what we're focusing on. So to the extent where we focus on the top of the funnel to grow that, that's obviously the most long-term beneficial. Um, but in some markets that are more mature, we can also add the later part of that, which is focusing on the ones that are already in the funnel and raising prices for them. So it's that balancing act that we need to play all the time. Um, but I, I would want to say, think about that mental model of the staircase and the ladder. And, and we are um, constantly in various stages uh, in various markets on that. And even among certain demographics in an existing market, we may be at various stages in, in that ladder too. All right, we've got a follow up from Josh Slay uh, on pricing. What could be the impacts of Apple's bundle to Spotify's pricing? Well, I, I think the primary um, impact, um, one, I, I would start off by saying we haven't noticed any impact, um, and I think that's evident by the, the quarter we had. Um, but to the extent that there is an impact, it's uh, obviously going to reinforce their ecosystem. So if you're already bought into the Apple ecosystem fully, um, this gives you an even further uh, reason to, to stick with that ecosystem and double down uh, on that. Now, that said, uh, what we're actually finding is most customers aren't in just one ecosystem because most of our competitors, by the way, are the, the ecosystem competitors like Google or Amazon or Apple at this point. And they're all trying, obviously, to create as many incentives as possible to get customers to stay within one ecosystem. And what we're finding is more and more the customers are actually um, experimenting across many different ecosystems. So they may be um, an Apple iPhone user, but they may have an Android auto car, or they may have an Alexa device in their homes. So they're across many of these different ecosystems. And this is where our ubiquity strategy is so important because we play uh, very nice on all hardware, regardless of if it's Google's devices, Apple's devices, or Amazon devices. Um, so I think this is a key sort of competitive a difference between us um, and the normal ecosystem players whose real business model is to just reinforce the ecosystem that they're already in. Okay, and the next question comes from Richard Greenfield. <clears throat> Advertising is still less than 10% of your revenues despite how fast you scaled MAUs globally. What do you think the long-term revenue mix looks like? Do you want to go first, Paul, or do you want me to go? Um, I can go first. Um, look, I think we are very bullish and optimistic on the advertising opportunity um, for us at Spotify. I think, you know, we've talked about it. We should be, you know, north of 10%. I think, you know, could it be 20%? I think 100% it could. Um, you know, we have, you know, tremendous growth on the, on the music side, on overall MAUs and free music, and then you throw a podcast on top of it uh, and the growth there. We think there's a lot of opportunity, I think, for us, you know, the innovation we're bringing into the, the market and the ecosystem, I think, is really going to be helpful. I think there's been very little innovation, particularly on the podcasting side, in terms of how to better target advertising and allow creators to actually monetize their product in a much higher way. And I think our ability to help bring those tools and services into the ecosystem will be great for the overall growth of the uh, of the business. It will allow creators to actually 
um, make more money off of their podcast. Um, and I think it will benefit us as well. So I think we, st we still see tremendous opportunity for, uh, you know, for advertising to be a larger share of our overall revenue going forward. My only addition, again, is, um, you know, our goal is to be the number one audio platform in the world. Uh, audio as a category is going to be absolutely massive. And I think the good news is if you look at the comparison, uh, I do think we have a sheet sheet. Um, just look at video. Uh, I think it's very evident that some of the growth in the ad platforms that you saw this quarter from the other players in the industry was focused on video ads. And so um, as I look at that and I, I look at um, audio, we still have a lot of innovation to do on that format. Uh, but it's evident to me that at maturity, the business model will not be just about a subscription uh, for Spotify. It's going to be the combination of subscription, um, it's going to be advertising, and it's going to be a la carte, all three of them um, in an interplay. And our goal is to try to grow into the, becoming the largest um, platform in that. And I think you can add uh, innovation on the ad side and you get to internet level monetization, which if you think about it from the offline to online parallel, uh, online usually is worse at the beginning, but then over time as uh, it sees more, um, um, more, more innovation on the stack, um, usually following a big platform growth on user side, then monetization st starts to catch up. And I think you should expect the same journey here. That's certainly what we're investing against. Next question comes from Ben Swinburne of Morgan Stanley. What drove the decision to raise prices in the markets you called out in the shareholder letter? Why these seven? Why family plan? What are the signals you're looking for in other markets to move to raise prices? And what's your assessment of the risk competitors continue to discount more or subsidize uh, in the case of Apple TV Plus free with Apple Music in order to take share? Yeah, I think um, you know, it goes back to what I said earlier on. For us, it's, it's a lot about looking at each market individually and thinking about um, where are they in the evolution of streaming? Where are we in terms of you know, market share within those markets? How long have we been in those markets? What are the um, you know, trends we're seeing? You know, to some extent, if you look at the markets we, we did raise prices in, they're somewhat diverse. It gives us some um, element of sort of testing and understanding of different types of markets, some larger ones, smaller ones, and different geographic mix. Um, you know, and, and we think there's, you know, why family plan? Obviously, we, we think there's a tremendous amount of value within the family plan. Um, so we, we thought that was an area where um, there might be an opportunity where, where um, it would work in some markets. And so um, we're really testing and learning. We've, as we mentioned earlier, we've done this in a couple of markets, um, and we'll continue to learn and iterate where we think it makes sense. All right, next question from John Egbert at Stiefel. You're about two months into the non-exclusive addition of Joe Rogan to the platform. Can you talk about how the podcast has performed relative to expectations thus far? Are you reaching a large number of listeners that are also consuming music for the first time? Are people listening outside the U.S.? Yeah, overall, um, great success so far. Um, I think the real test will come, however, when um, the, the podcast becomes exclusive at the platform, but we're very encouraged with the launch so far. Um, it's very much been a, an international hit, which may have been a little bit of a surprise. We thought maybe it would skew more U.S. than what it has. So I think that speaks to the appeal just of the platform that we have for someone like Joe Rogan, but also, of course, uh, the appeal of his show um, that it has on audiences all around the world. Um, so we're, we're encouraged with it. And in fact, we're encouraged with most of the original and exclusives that we've launched so far, of which I, I do want to um, just add as a caveat, like Joe Rogan launched in September. So these are recent um, numbers. And um, on the list uh, for Q4, uh, the slate looks just fantastic. So. I think you should be expecting us to do a lot more than what you've seen even so far. And I think one, once we summarize the year and certainly the next sort of six months, when we look back on it, I think you'll, you'll see that a part of the success will be Joe Rogan, but it's really a whole slate of number of different content pieces that are interacting and creating a much better experience on Spotify than what you can find on other platforms. Yeah, and I would just add, um, 
just on top of that, the um, JRE is number one podcast in a number of markets um, and some markets that are non-English speaking as well. So we know that he travels uh, really well globally. Okay, great. <clears throat> Next question from Kevin Rippey at Evercore ISI. Can you discuss the factors that led the Michelle Obama podcast to be made available on platforms other than Spotify? Uh, over, overall, it's, um, I think it's important to talk about the fact that uh, in many cases when we do deals um, and when they become available on the platform, we've done the deals um, sometimes even a year prior um, to uh, the deals becoming available. And um, more and more so our strategy going forward will be to make more and more of the content exclusive to um, Spotify. But in this particular instance, um, it was the early days, and we made the decision to um, experiment and have it windowed by being available on Spotify first and then later make it available on the platform. And we'll still experiment, by the way, I do want to say, but I think as a strategy, you should expect more and more of the content to go entirely exclusive, like um, with Joe Rogan. Okay, another question from John Egbert. It's people. Can you discuss the adoption and P&L impact of the two-sided marketplace tools relative to your expectations? Are you on track to meet or exceed the 50% growth target for gross profit from two-sided marketplace? And has UMG's commitment accelerated adoption, or has the cadence of album releases during COVID been a headwind? Um, yeah, so at a high level, um, we are still on plan to meet the expectations for the full year that we gave in terms of marketplace contribution to, to gross profits, and nothing has changed there. Um, and then maybe I'll let Daniel talk about the UMG side. Yeah, again, um, it, it's still early days in terms of the UMG deal, but obviously I think um, this is fantastic for just a, as an endorsement for the marketplace strategy, and we're still um, ramping up that partnership and bringing more and more uh, of um, uh, UM, UMG's inventory uh, onto the marketplace. Um, so that's uh, still very much the focus, but I think it bodes really well for 2021. And um, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, we have a 76% increase in unique participants on our products and a 74% retention. So I think that speaks well to the fact that people are enjoying uh, this, uh, it is becoming a bit more of a word of mouth where more and more creators and artists see this. And again, to, to kind of take two steps back, the goal here uh, is we, in the marketplace strategy, we want to do three things. We want to create more and more tools for artists and labels to grow um, their fan base on Spotify um, and then add more and more tools and services to enable them to interact with those fans and more and more tools and services that enables them to monetize uh, those fans better than what they're currently doing. That is the strategy, and, and we're adding more and more um, tools, and you should expect us to double down on that strategy. Great. The next question comes from Stephen Cajal at Wells Fargo. We've seen a number of advertising companies speak to Q4 being sequentially worse for ad growth due to rising coronavirus cases. What's baked into your Q4 guide in terms of ad revenue or ad ARPU? Yeah, as I said earlier, we don't give specific guidance on our premium versus ad, but um, I did say we expect that the year-over-year -year growth in advertising in Q4 will uh, be higher than what we saw in Q3. Um, obviously, there's a lot of uncertainty around COVID, around a, a second or third wave, and so um, there's some conservatism in our numbers, we, we would hope, but again, there's a lot of uncertainty as well. And my only addition, of course, is that while, of course, we care about advertising, it's still a relatively small of the, a small part of the overall revenue pool. All right. The next question comes from Justin Patterson. Podcasts have been a meaningful investment area for the past two years. Can you discuss what you have learned during this time frame and how audience reach is translating into listening hours and subscriber conversion? What are the next levers to improve the user experience? Um, obviously, a, a tremendous amount of learnings uh, in, in podcasting, uh, some that translated incredibly well from music uh, into audio. I think the most important uh, was the, the core thesis we had as we started doing this was that we could serve users better by not just doing music, but actually adding podcasting as well. 
uh, and that the net result would be that we, you would see a higher um, engagement and higher retention across both categories. That has turned out to be true, and I think that uh, should um, give you a lot of encouragement as investors that the strategy is working. Um, then in terms of all the other aspects, of course, like if you think about music, it's a three-and-a-half-minute um, a piece of content uh, that you're selling, so a lot of it, it's it, it's not a huge investment for people to try out a new song. In podcasting, uh, in many cases, it may be half an hour to an hour's worth of investment to try a new podcaster. So the way we merchandise content, the way we recommend content, is entirely different in uh, podcasting as it is in 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 uh, from from music. So that's still an area where we're developing a lot of learnings and trying a lot of things. So for instance, we shipped a few quarters ago trailers um, as a way of, of uh, giving people a snack uh, by a way of discovering uh, new shows. And uh, we have many, many more experiments currently underway and many more things that you should expect us to ship too. Um, um, but overall, I think the, the key thing to, to look into is we are using the podcast back now to give creators further ability to engage with their fans. Um, music and talk being the primary example this quarter where, um, you know, whether you're a podcaster now, you can all of, uh, uh, we know music is a huge use case for a lot of podcasters, but licensing has been a, a big problem. And because Spotify has music and podcasts on the very same platform, we now have that benefit where podcasters can talk about uh, music and incorporate that in their shows. And that's great. And, great. and just uh, similarly, we know a lot of uh, music artists want to talk about the music that they're creating. And so music and talk works really well for them too. So this is just another way where you can see a natural extension of this audio first strategy playing out uh, in the open. And you should look uh, for more developments on those formats. Uh, we've talked in the past about polls uh, as well, um, being one of those things that we have experimented with. So many, many more things to enable more engagement between creators and fans. All right, great. And we are actually out of time for today's Q&A session. I'd like to turn the call back over to Daniel for some closing remarks. All right. Well, thanks, Brian. Uh, well, I'm really proud of our team and how well our business has performed over the first nine months of the year. And as I said earlier, it's a real testament to our flywheel. And as we gain momentum, I strongly believe that you'll see us drive greater acquisition, retention, engagement, and monetization, which is good for Spotify, good for our users, and good for creators. And there's no doubt it's also good for the entire audio ecosystem. And for that reason, as well as the continued outperformance of our business, I remain very optimistic. For more on this quarter, by the way, listen to the Spotify for the record uh, podcast, which will go live on our platform tomorrow morning. So that's a big plug for me to end it all. Thanks again for joining us and have a great day. Okay. Thanks again, everyone, for joining. The replay of the call will be available on our website and also on the Spotify app under Spotify Earnings Call Replays. Thanks again. This concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect.